Enville, Staffs, on the birdsong twittering deep blue end of an English Maytime. The bougainvillea are burning like a flame in the day. The treetops are all frothy with hawthorn. The first luster of the bluebells in the woods is dimming. The magnolia, a mere memory. Accidental alliteration. You'll excuse, I hope. That tower behind me, those blank castellations. Gilbert Scott got here, but he didn't make too much of a mess of it, did he? It's like a, a sandstone parallel universe. Gloucester, Taunton, a hundred other beautifully adorned towers spring to mind. For most people though, it's the site of Stourbridge Rockers Witchfinder General's interesting front cover for their debut album Friends of Hell, which of course spawned the single Death Penalty, the cover of which was shot at the arguably less attractive Wensbury Churchyard. Both of them, of course, show soon to be um, topless model and penthouse pet Joanne Latham, Wolfrunian Joanne Latham, being menaced by various members of the band in pseudo medieval garb um, it's difficult to know what to say after that isn't it is that the album before or after soviet invasion it's actually the one before soviet invasion yeah soviet invasion which of course um, takes their oeuvre straight into the heart of the 20th century but the quality doesn't dip don't worry indeed from the ridiculous to the sublime, the coolness of the interior on an English summer's day. An awful lot more excitement within than one might think. What did I say? Not just the looping fulsomeness of the arcades themselves with that spinning, curving, curvilinear symmetry of those delicious capital tops or the exhilaration of those 12th century statues on top of the spandrel arches but this particular set of, of four misery chords, one of which, this one of which, it it's probably my favourite English misery chord. It's got a, a rider on horseback being crushed by his portcullis. I mean, what? It's just fab, isn't it? I don't know. I mean, you know, Leslie Halliwell had 200 films in his top 10. I've got a lot of misery chords in my top 10 misery chord list, but I don't suppose there's that many other people who spend that much time thinking about their top 10 misery chords, are there? 
I don't know. I mean, between thinking about climate change, the planet burning up, the problems of AI, uh, declining government public standards and potholes in the road, I think there's probably more people than you think compiling their list of best misery records. Those four subjects you just spoke of there would make a set of misery records for the modern age, wouldn't they? Blimey. to drink in the Bathams on Enville Street much later. I lived in Enville Street, never really thought about Enville though. I also remember Will Court, one of my dad's glass and ceramic students, sitting on our sofa at 23A Farlands Road and talking to my dad about his plan to combine his two hobbies of brewing beer and beekeeping. Seems to have gone okay for him that, doesn't it? Talk about sharply contrasting terracotta ecclesiastical edifices. The church atop the hill at Wolverley, Worcestershire. For we have meandered across the border. I knew Enville as a child and Wolverley. They were on their way to Kimver, around there, somewhere about Kimver Edge being one of my Sunday places along with Clent and Witchbury Hill. But I didn't really place them geographically of how near they were or far they were from Stourbridge or each other. It's only just really dawning on me now. They were places I ended up at the end of a, a night after the pub or on a ride on a Sunday afternoon with my parents, swimming in and out of my geographical perception. You're not really that bothered when you're young, are you? County boundaries don't matter much. It strikes me as odd that I get so much fun out of them now. That's sort of semi-imaginary lines on a, an artificially constructed flat surface, half to do with feudal deeds and accidents of history and, and finance and land ownership. And yet there's something very satisfying. We're in the little tail now. Staffordshire is a big distended tadpole with a tiny tail. I used to walk along, moping along with my stereo Walkman when I was a teenager. And sometimes I would come like Charlton Heston, comes across the, uh, the decontextualised coronet of the Statue of Liberty, half exposed in the sand. Sometimes I would come to the Staffordshire sign, being born as I was in, in Worcestershire, uh, and give it half a thought, maybe not even that. But it seems strange that we slip in and out of the, 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 the semi-artificial identities here. It's a strange little place beautiful, not much going on in a good way and synonymous of course with John Baskerville, the papier-mâché artist, godfather and forefather of the modern press and typesetting, deist and his extraordinary post-mortem life. I used to know someone who had a um, a zombie card. You remember the donor cards that used to say, I would like someone to live after my death. It had a picture of a zombie on and it said, I would like to live after my death. Well, John Baskerville did, in a way. So yeah, the star of the show, John Baskerville. As I've said, papier-mâché, Japaning, but best known as a printer and type designer of some repute. Um, he was a, a forward-thinking, remarkable individual in many ways. 
his um, desire to emancipate his mind, in his own words, from the idle fears of superstition and the wicked arts of the priesthood. Actually, um, which find a general would have, would have enjoyed this tale, wouldn't they? The wicked arts of the priesthood being high on their agenda. His, his desire to free himself from all of that have, have, have led to him being recast historically as, as an atheist, which he wasn't. He was a deist. Um, he believed in a god like Abraham Lincoln, not a god like Abraham Lincoln, but, but like Abraham Lincoln, he believed in a god, but one that didn't interfere in human affairs. One can only wonder whether he was just tempted in this instance to just have a bit of an interfere, just as a bit of a joke with, uh, with John, because he died 23rd of January 1775 at his home uh, on Easy Hill, and that's where it gets really interesting. So he lies there for a bit, underneath his conical structure, which at some point we're not quite sure when or why or how gets taken down. And 40 years later, in December 1820, some workmen who are getting gravel for the upcoming canal building um, uncover his, his lead-lined coffin. One year later, the accumulating works on the, the, the canal wharf necessitate proper disinterment, and thus begins the tale of John Baskerville's inhumations and exhumations. So, after its initial disinterment, it gets stored in Gibson and Sons um, Ironmongery Warehouse on Cambridge Street, and then at some point gets moved to John Marston's Plumbing and Glazing Shop on Monmouth Street. I think Gibson must have still owned it though, because he used to charge one penny per head to see the corpse, so it must have been opened and closed, the casket opened and closed. On one of those occasions, Gibson apparently described the skin on the face as being dry and perfect, but the eyes gone, and described an overwhelming smell of cheese. Nice. So while he's out of his box this time, 19-year-old Thomas Underwood, who was to become Birmingham's most famous lithographic artist, does a, a fabulously ghoulish sketch of him. You need to look it up. Um, although his eyes were said to have gone, it seems to show them peering from within his skull in a, a look of, of horror at what has happened to him. Um, would arguably have made a, a better front cover for Friends of Hell. So he gets moved again, and for the next 60 odd years, people don't seem quite sure where he's been moved to. Someone says that he's been moved to Cradley Chapel, which belongs to um, beneficiaries uh, of the Baskerville will. And then in 1851, it's recorded that he has been buried underneath Christchurch in Birmingham. Um, but it's not till 1891 that somebody suggests actually checking the, the vault. Um, and checking the records of interment there and they find that there are 136 um, graves therein underneath the church but only 135 have been registered and so once again he gets dug up and he gets reburied outside the walls of Christ Church. So you really would think that was an end to it, wouldn't you? But of course it isn't. In 1897, Christchurch gets demolished. A year later, 123 years after his original burial, on the 26th of February, 1898, he is finally reburied in Warston Cemetery. In 1963, they try to dig him up again, on the grounds, no pun intended, that it's consecrated ground, which is contrary to his rather spectacular will. But as far as we know, he's still under there. Or maybe he isn't. Maybe, as we speak, he's on the move again. What was I saying? He's been dug up again. Look, he's here. 
Well, I came out this morning and there he was. <laughs> Unbelievable. I never thought he'd be pink though, did you? That is a bit of a surprise. I used to do that when I visited Kinveredge as a kid, just rubbing the sandstone away with my finger like the honeyed gold Cotswold stone at the Warwickshire end of the Cotswolds, the top end, crumbles to the touch. Didn't seem remarkable at the time, but nothing does in childhood, does it? Childhood negates all of your experiences, negates the spectacular quality of your experiences by virtue of them being yours, they can't be special, they can't be as worthy of note as anyone else's experiences or location or past. And then you realise your head clears the water in adulthood and you realise that of course they are. And it is an amazing area, the stone, the, the deep, deep colour of it just rearing up by the side of the road and, and the last English troglodytes, there's a Peel Session band name for you. Right up to the 1960s, people were still living in these caves. Absolutely remarkable. Speaking of the last English troglodytes, we're just down the road a stretch in Kimver, Kimver Edge, the Holy Austin Rock Houses. I used to come here in 1973 and I'm convinced that same ice cream van was parked in exactly the same spot, the distorting mirrors of memory perhaps. The funny thing is though, we're here after closing time and that couldn't have been the case back then because there was nothing to close. It was all open, open to the air, open to the public. The rock houses were venues for glue sniffers and fire builders and graffiti artists, great places to pretend to be the brain of Morbius, of course, or his creator Solon, portrayed by the great Philip Maddock, places to be chased by your brother or to chase your brother. Makes you wonder, what next? The multi-storey car park in Stourbridge, the Black Country Museum itself, of course, is testimony now world-class um, film and TV location that it is to the fact that if you keep anything long enough it becomes of interest. How long have we got left though to that zero hour? How long is there left to keep things, I wonder? <laughs> Yeah, there they are, embourgeoised, wisteria laden, tarted up and sanitised for public consumption. Mm. Yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of this kind of thing over in Spain. All oh, right. Um, although it, they're not tourist attractions as, as much as, um, you know, real neighbourhoods. Are they still being lived in? You say? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Where there's there's a lot. Um, so in Granada, there's. Um, there's a neighbourhood called Sacramont, right. um, which is, I believe, kind of the, the birthplace of, of flamenco oh, nice. uh, or, or something like that. And it's kind of multi, multiple levels. It's all whitewashed and the yeah. houses are kind of built into the caves in, in sort of the hills, sort of winding little streets. It's an absolutely wow. beautiful neighbourhood. And then, yeah, just outside of there some, in, in Andalusia, there's a little town called Guadix. And it's a normal little Spanish town, but then there's a suburb, you just walk out of the town, there's a suburb, it's all kind of hills and, and built into the hills are, are cave houses and the locals will, who live there for a couple of euros will, will show you around the house 
Uh, it's very, very nice. Again, currently occupied, are you saying? Yes, currently oh, occupied. Yeah. Well, I even saw um, an episode of Place in the Sun where they were showing somebody cave houses. Right. Um, and they were really cheap, you know, and okay. kind of some of them were really quite appealing, I have to say. Yeah, because these were lived in not long before my childhood. Um, in fact, I think only a, a very few short years before my childhood, as were quite a few in the UK. They're not the only ones. This one's nearest ones I can think of, perhaps a harbour of rocks in Derbyshire. Although that's a bit... Uh, the idea of being a hermit in harbour of rocks seems a lot more forbidding. Um, looking out as you are onto the plains of Derbyshire, here you're a little bit enclosed. Um, the whole thing is, is rather... Um, rather cosy, uh, although it seems it at this time of year, I doubt that it seems it's on a January day. I don't know. It's, it's impossible to imagine now, isn't it, in this, this modern age of, of everyone being so hidebound by electronic recognition, the multifarious mechanisms of society recognising and tabulating everyone. I don't know. Do you think we've lost something? Um... I think I think we're always losing something. Yeah, we are. Yeah. I think there are always things being lost, but I also think that you can't stop that. Um, sadly, I think that we are. You know, we're living in a, in a in a time where I don't know. In many ways, life is is far better and more enjoyable than it used to be in various ways. But we're we're also constantly losing touch with things. But I, I think. I think that's unavoidable, so I think just, you know, there's no turning the clock back. No, indeed. No, it's, it's, it's a little bit like your tripod, though, isn't it? You know, it, it, it's just not as good as it used to be, though, isn't no, it? No, that's right. This tripod that the camera's currently standing on has always been rubbish, mm -hmm. but, um, but it's even worse than it used to be, which is... A poor slogan um, for any National Trust property, I think. Yes, but it's uh, certainly a metaphor for our times, isn't it? It's never been very good, <laughs> but it's even worse it's even than it worse. used to be. England, 2023. <laughs> itself more childhood memories drifting on the wind I used to come here in search of Natrix Natrix and Vipera Berus and Lacerta Lacerta Latin names of common English reptiles being as I was the youngest member of the British Herpetological Society the Society for the Study of Reptiles and Amphibians as I may have told you before I never ever looked to one side in those days, I saw Dudley, Top Church, Turner's Hill Mast, all the black country points of reference on my psychic map. My eyes were down, looking at the ground, waiting for the flash of a scale or tail. Makes me feel pensive, restless, unsettled, stirring up the memories, mixing dead roots with desire like T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Any last thoughts today on any of the subjects we've covered, Lee? You know, new wave of British heavy metal, topless models, beer infused with honey, death, interments, disinternments, that sort of thing. Yeah, the general decline of uh, society. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the, the end times. Yeah, the, yeah, the end times. Towards, uh, yeah. Nah, not really. No. No. no, it's a bit disappointing that it's, it's hauntingly reminiscent as well of the response that Walsall Town Council gave when they were offered to have the tram extend all the way and therefore de-isolate their community. Yeah, they just said, nah, we don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> Let it off.